lived in Boston, New York, and Buffalo. Five hundred handsome sailor lads a whaling far to go. Singing, blow ye winds in the morning, blow ye winds high oh, and haul away running gear and blow, blow, blow. They tell you of the clipper ships a running in and out. And say we'll take 500 whales before we're six months out. Singing, blow you winds in the morning, blow you winds high, oh. All the way you're running gear and blow, blow, blow you winds in the morning, blow you winds high, oh. All the way you're running gear. The film you saw just a moment ago was Moby Dick, a picture that brings us back to a time over a hundred years ago when America had a golden age, the golden age of whaling. From Nantucket and New Bedford, New England captains guided their sailing ships into the boundless wilderness of the seven seas in search of the greatest animal that ever lived, the whale. These were the essentials of this greatest of adventures, the whale ship equipped to sail through any weather, the whale boat crewed by men ready for battle, headed by the harpooner and the whale, whose flesh rendered into oil, lit the lamps of America. In the Golden Age, hundreds of ships composed America's whaling fleet. Now all except one are gone, the Charles W. Morgan, which is birthed in a bed of sand at Mystic Seaport, Connecticut. Mystic was one of the smaller seaports of New England in the 19th century. Today, however, it houses the most extensive collection of maritime Americana in the world. Here, it's possible to walk along a waterfront of early America, visiting the stores and shops where New England seamen provisioned their ships for long voyages to the ends of the earth. Which spoiled his constitution. Way, haul away. We'll haul away, Joe. Now, when I was a little boy, it was that my mother told me. Way, haul away, we'll haul away, Joe. That if I didn't kiss the girls, my lips would all grow moldy. Way, the curator haul of the Marine Historical Association at Mystic Seaport is Mr. Edouard A. Stackpole, a native of Nantucket and a descendant of the Pinkham and Folger families of that island who furnished many a sea captain to man the whale ships of the Golden Age. This fine old whale ship, the Charles W. Morgan, the last of the American whale ships. She was built in 1841 and for 80 years was an active whaler. Over 900 men served aboard the Morgan and the lives of all of them are symbolized by this fine old whale ship, the story of man's struggle, man against the sea. Man against the sea. There's something in that that Harks back to a primeval urge to combat. Don't you think so, Edward? Yes, Charles, there's no denying that. The law of the sea and the ships that sail on them, I suppose, is one of the underlying reasons why men went to sea in the first place. And, of course, the reasons why men went to uh, whaling from New England. Well, what was that story about Nantucket girls and the harpooners? That must have spurred the enlistment of young men. Yes, you mean the legend that a Nantucket girl wouldn't marry a man until he'd harpooned his first whale. Yeah. Well, there's a degree of prestige, of course, in being a successful harpooner, and Nantucket women took pride in the accomplishments of their men, so there's a grain of truth in the story, though I really don't think that the marriage rate on Nantucket directly responded to the death rate of whales. <laughs> when was the golden age of whaling? Well, I think that the Golden Age reached its climax between 1830 and 1850. After that, of course, the discovery of rock oil or petroleum doomed the whaling industry. And in spite of a boom for a while in buggy whips and ladies' cossets, the whaling fleets passed away. 
Well, and by 1921, only one wooden whale ship was left. Only one? The, the Morgan? That's incredible. Yes, it is. And what is even more incredible to me as an historian and as a New Englander is the fact that the United States, which once was the greatest of all whaling nations, has now not one whale ship in the world. Now, why is that? Well, I think it's probably because uh, uh, we've lost a number of things, but most important of all, we have lost probably our whaling tradition or our maritime tradition. And, of course, the uh, American maritime tradition is something we should never lose. An American maritime tradition. Yes, Charles, when people think of the growth of this country, they think of the West. And, of course, uh, that probably is true, that uh, that was an important part. But before the opening of the West, this country was basically a maritime nation. And one of the basic reasons for our war with Great Britain was the uh, freedom of the seas. Our economy was dependent upon freedom, and we fought for it. The free men who, of course, fought these uh, freedoms at sea were not lapped uh, to come ashore and lose them. And uh, just as the men of the sea had an individual responsibility in their ships, that on land they had the same individual responsibility. To the welfare of the Republic. Yes. And Mystic has been dedicated to that maritime tradition of individual freedom. Yes, Charles. That the character of our maritime ancestors be understood and the contribution that they made toward this country's progress not be forgotten. And of course, there's more value to that than meets the eye. Iron men and wooden ships. Right. They were iron men, but their life was their own choice, and they uh, regarded these hardships as a test of their character. Their ships are made of New England oak and pine and were capable of withstanding all the hazards of the sea. In such ships, they rounded the horn, went to the Antarctic, tested the typhoon to the China Sea, and all before the advent of the so-called steam vessel. It's hard for us to conceive of a voyage in that period, but let's go back to Mystic Seaport, Connecticut, in the mid-1800s for the start of such a voyage that got underway to the sound of a traditional sea shanty. As I was walking down Paradise Street To me way, hey, blow the man down A pretty young damsel I chanced for to meet Give me some time to blow the man down She was round in the counter and bluff in the bow to me way, hey, blow the man down. So I took in all sail and cried, way, enough now. Give me some time to blow the man down. I hailed her in English. Before sailing, a whale ship had to be adequately provisioned with foodstuffs and the necessities for the long voyage at sea. I'm from the Black Arrow bound for the Shakespeare. Give me some time to blow the man down. Blow the man down, bullies, blow the man down. To me way, hey, blow the man down. I'm from the Black Arrow bound for the Shakespeare. Give me some time to blow the man down. So I tailed her my flipper, and I took her in tow. To me way, no whale must be lost because of a bad harpoon. The man down, and it's yard arm to yard arm, off we did go. Give me some time to blow the man down. And as we was walking, she said unto me, to me way, hey, blow the man down. There's a spanking full rigor just ready. The herbs, brews, and ointments, Give which were the medicines of the time, were essential supplies. Down. Now this spanking full rigor for New York was bound. To me way, hey, Topsails, mainsails, royals, to gallants, jibs, well made, sails well made and in plenty. Well Give me some time to blow the man down. The last supplies are stowed on board, including livestock. 
for fresh provisions. In his counting house, the owner gives final orders to the captain. Then the captain confers with the first mate, everything to be ready to sail with the tide. Finally, the crew settles their personal belongings in the forecastle, their home for who knows how long. The wooden rattle calls the men to quarters. See at last, all sails spread to carry us south by east, south by west, to round the horn our good hope. Bound for the wading grounds of the southern seas, cruising on course, no matter what the weather. You know, Edouard, as I walked through the Morgan, I got a feeling of harshness, of severity almost, which didn't jibe at all with the romantic notions I expected to have. Well, Charles, whaling was not an easy trade. Voyages lasted and sometimes as long as uh, three years and until the hold was full of sperm oil. And it would take them three years to get a hold full, huh? Yes, uh, three years was not an, an unusual length of voyage. My golly. Why, the cruise quarters uh, down below there were no bigger, uh, well, half the size of my living room. Yes, 20 men lived in a space of about 16 feet square. And of course, not all were there at one time because the watchers had to go on deck at odd times. They must have got to know each other very well, too well, perhaps. That was one of the hazards of whaling. They were, of course, the very real dangers that Melville so vividly describes in Moby Dick storms and shipwrecks and tyrannous captains and hostile natives. And then there was the actual encounter with the whale. Well, was Melville right in his account of the whale attacking the whale boats and destroying Ahab's ship? Melville knew what he was writing about. Sperm whales frequently stove in 
a whaleboat, and many a ship's log has the entry, boat stove after harpooning whale. As for the sinking of Ahab's ship by Moby Dick, Melville was certainly familiar with the story of the loss of the Essex, uh, which was sunk by a sperm whale deliberately and rammed about uh, oh, 1,200 miles east northeast of the Marquesas Islands. Few survived that particular uh, encounter, so that the uh, one wasn't always certain about what was going to happen when they fought a whale. <laughs> a rare classic film taken in 1921 on the Morgan on one of her last voyages brings us back to a critical moment in any whaling voyage. Now the whaling grounds are reached. wind is fair, the sail is hoisted. A school of sperm whales, mightiest of mammals. The men seize their paddles to help the sail. Close to the whales, the mast is stepped, and the men take up their oars. speed, the whale starts a wild dash called by New England whalemen a Nantucket sleigh ride. To keep the boat from being swamped, some of the line must be paid out from the tub aft around the loggerhead and then forward through the chocks of the bow. The line goes out at such speed that it is necessary to wet down the loggerhead to keep it from getting on fire. keep it up for hours and often a boat disappeared over the horizon, never to be seen again. has changed places with the harpooner. His job is to kill the whale with his lance. It is a perilous moment as the dying whale is desperate. The men right the boat. To the whale ship. Now the key is ours, my boys will tow him alongside. 
Here the blubber is hacked off with blubber spades, and the blubber pieces are hoisted aboard as one would peel a great orange. The great windlass whirls away and hoists the blubber aboard. The blubber is then sliced up and thrown into great tripods, where it is boiled into oil, which is then cooled and stored in the hold. Perhaps 60 whales and many months later, the whale ship starts for home. But the sea does not give up its riches easily. Many a laden ship had a long battle before its voyage was over. The sailor's bird of destiny, the albatross, could pretend a calm voyage or a stormy sea. At last, the storm is over, and the ship, again on course, journeys home. So that's a typical voyage of the golden age of whaling. Well, not exactly, Charles. Even with motion pictures, you couldn't hope to catch all the events that made up whaling trips 
the sights and the smells and the tediums and the dangers and enthusiasms. They were all part of each day and night. Still, we have an idea of what it must have been like and how much individual responsibility counted. Thank you, Mr. Stackpole, for helping us get an insight into the golden age of whaling. Thank you, Charles. The whaleman of the early 19th century was a citizen of a watery world. He was a worker who added to the wealth of his country, an oceanographer who uh, contributed much to the world's knowledge of the sea, a sea hunter whose exploits mark a bright page in American history. This ends adventure for the summer. Until we meet again, bon voyage. And we're bound for the Rio Grande. We're bound for the Rio Grande. Sing goodbye, you ladies we know in this town. Where I we've left you enough for to buy a silk gown, and we're bound for the Rio Grande. Where I we've left you enough for to buy a silk gown. Opening film portion from the Warner Brothers production, Moby Dick. A Moulin film by John Houston. Visit the American Museum of Natural History and have your own adventure. It's open every day and there's never an admission charge. Or let the museum come to you through a subscription to Natural History magazine. To become a museum member and receive the magazine, just send $5 to the American Museum of Natural History, New York, 24, New York. Ed Sullivan has a terrific lineup of stars to entertain you tonight. Watch the Ed Sullivan Show this evening and meet Matt Cho, Francis' singing sensation, 